In this video, we're going to be discussing the good old Caterpillar 3126. Hey guys, Josh with the Adept Ape channel, and in this video, we're going to be discussing my favorite small cat diesel engine, the 3126. We're also going to have a Destruction of the Week segment at the end of this video. And before we get into the video, I'd like to thank Greg, Martin, Miguel, Bill, Chris, Max, and Jason for helping to support this video. If you would like to support the making of these videos, adeptape at yahoo.com on PayPal. All right, let's get into the video. So Caterpillar never made a light-duty diesel engine. They made medium-duty and heavy-duty. And medium-duty are basically their 3116s, 3208s. C7s, 3126s, C9s, the heavy duties are the C13s, the C15s, the 3406s, things like that. So why is the 3126 my personal favorite? Well, I find it to be more reliable and easier to work on than the earlier and the later model engines, and we'll be getting into the specifics on that throughout this video. So let's get into the specifics of this engine. First thing is a walk around of the engine. So our walk around here on the intake side of the 3126 cat engine and on the back of the head you're going to have your fuel pressure regulator on the right there next to the lifting bracket. And then starting in the back of the engine you can see your ECM there. It's the black box with the lettering on it. Your P2 connector. We have your oil pressure sensor on your oil manifold. Also you can see your side covers there. We'll be discussing those in a little bit. And you can see the oil pouring out of them. Pretty common problem there. Moving up to our intake manifold, we have your boost pressure sensor. We have your inlet air temperature sensor. We have your inlet air heater solenoid, your fuel filter housing. You can see your injection actuation, also known as your Huey pressure sensor. The aluminum colored item here, that's your Huey pump. That's a round top one. And you can see your timing sensors here and some more oil leaks. Of course, those are your timing sensors. There's two there into your front structure above the power steering pump. So some of these engines are going to have air compressors. You can see your serpentine belt and there's also a small V belt there. And let me show you where your coolant temp sensor is. It's a little hard to see, but it's right there behind the Huey pump under your fuel filter. Now onto the exhaust side of the engine. So we have your thermostat housing, uses two thermostats. And this one would have a line running across it if it had an air compressor, but it does not. You can see your exhaust manifold there behind your intake tubes. You have your turbocharger, oil return line, oil cooler, oil filter. And another oil leak looks like a uh, rear structure is leaking here between the block and the rear structure. And that's your walk around. Okay, so that was a quick walk around of the engine. Let's discuss some of the specifications of the engine. So the 3126 was a engine that was designed after the 3116 and before the C7. It uses basically the same block as both of those engines. And it is an inline diesel engine, six cylinder. It uses a Huey system. For the fuel system, Huey is hydraulic electronic unit injector. It is a three valve per cylinder engine. It has two intake valves, one exhaust valve. It has a single turbocharger. The intake is on the left side of the engine. The exhaust is on the right side of the engine. It uses a gear driven oil pump. It uses a belt driven water pump. It has two thermostats. It has piston cooling jets. It does not, however, have wet liners, which is a negative because that makes rebuilding this engine more difficult than the heavy-duty engines, which have wet liners. It could be had from 175 horsepower all the way up to 330 horsepower. It had a 16 to 1 compression ratio. And these engines were made from the end of 1997 up till the end of about 2003. They actually were making these they were still making them when they started making the C7, which was the engine that took the place of the 3126. So why do I like this engine more than, let's say, the 3116 or the C7? 
Well, it's kind of, it has the best of both worlds between the 3116 and the C7. And I'm going to discuss kind of what I mean by that. So the 3116, most of the items on the engine were similar as far as the block, it didn't have wet liners, things like that. But it changed its very complicated internal rack mechanical fuel system to the Huey system. Now, the Huey system is not the greatest fuel system ever designed, but a lot of the smaller diesel engines at the time were starting to use this system as a way of getting away from the rack or the high pressure pump that the older engines used to use. So this being a Huey system, the fuel system is much easier. It's much more simple. There's no camshaft that actuates the injector. It's strictly high pressure oil. So let's discuss the Huey system a little bit. So if you're unfamiliar with the Huey system, basically the engine supplies normal oil pressure, you know, your 30 to 70 PSI of oil pressure to something called the Huey pump. The Huey pump is in place of the 3116 governor that used to be there. And the Huey pump takes that, we'll say 60 PSI of oil pressure, and then it bumps it up considerably. Anywhere from about 800 PSI all the way up to about 3,500 PSI. It then supplies that high pressure oil to your injectors. And that pressure is used to push the injector plunger internally to the injector to fire your cylinder. So it's still firing fuel, obviously. It's just using your high pressure oil, your Huey pressure, to fire the injectors. Now, the later model, the C7, which took the place of the 3126, also had a Huey system, but there's some differences between both of them, and I think the 3126 was a better system. Okay, so really, what's the difference between the C7 and the 3126 Huey systems, at least the ones with the round top Huey pump? Well, the nice thing about the round top Huey pumps is they have an external driver for the Huey pump. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, on the later model ones, the square top ones, the driver's internal and non-replaceable. The part is not available from CAT. So you'd have to change out if you have a Huey pump problem or a driver problem. You have to change the whole pump out. And you're looking, you know, about a thousand bucks from CAT for that. But if you have just a driver problem on the round top ones, you can change this to driver out. And it's a little less than $200 from your CAT dealer, which is obviously a lot less than the whole Huey pump. Not only that, it's much easier to change out. And if you're wondering what's under that round top on your Huey pump, there's nothing in there. A lot of people think it's a filter. It's actually just an accumulator. If you ever were to take it off, there's nothing in there. It, it just is used to store oil in the pump to obviously help with starting because it takes a little while to fill that pump. So what other issues in the Huey system make it a little bit better than the later model ones? Well, there were a lot of Huey pump failures on both the round top and the square top ones, but it seemed like they were more common and could be more catastrophic on the square top ones. But the other thing that is nice about 3126 and their Huey system is the injectors. Now, what do I mean by this? They both have injectors, they're both expensive. Well, the 3126, the injectors are much, much easier to remove. They change the O-ring and the, the more like little backing rings, and they change the design on the C7. The C7 injectors are much harder to get out than the 3126 ones. The problem is the 3126 ones, they have kind of a more funky bolt design and the bolts are more expensive and you're supposed to replace them when you change the injectors. But they also do not have a calibration file, unlike the C7. So if you own one of these, 3126, and you need to change an injector out yourself, you can. There's no programming of the ECM, there's no uh, trim file to change out if you're doing an injector. Only on the C7s you have to worry about that. So that makes them a little bit nicer. So this engine could be had with two different style oil pans. There was a 7-inch, 5-gallon sump oil pan. There's also a 9.5-inch, 7-gallon oil pan design. And your maintenance intervals are going to be about 10,000 miles or 250 hours of runtime per engine service. And then about every 2,000 hours or every 100,000 miles, you're going to want to get your valve lash adjusted. And the valve lash on this is the easiest valve lash you could possibly do. 
it's 15 and 25 thousandths, 15 on the intake, 25 thousandths on the exhaust. And that's it. There's no IVAs. There's no injector adjustment. You can do a valve lash in under an hour if you are familiar with these. They're uh, quite easy to do yourself. Outside of that, there's not a lot of periodic maintenance you have to do this other than just expecting for leaks and things like that. Now, these do have a separate V-belt drive for your water pump than the main serpentine belt. So, unlike the C7s where the serpentine belt runs your water pump, this is going to have its own small V-belt that's going to be on your pulley off of the crankshaft that's going to run your water pump. And you're going to want to get that changed if you ever are doing your serpentine belt. And that belt can be kind of a pain, not necessarily the belt, but the adjuster for it is not a automatic tensioner for such as like your serpentine belt. It's a manual tensioner. So you have to get in there and tighten it and loosen it. And it's it can be a pain to get to. Also, the bolts, they can strip out or break because they go into your front structure. And those can be kind of a pain. Outside of that, there's not really much maintenance problems with this engine. So speaking of problems, what are the main problems this engine tends to have? Well, I already mentioned that it doesn't have wet liners. So if it's starting to eat a lot of oil or you're starting to get a lot of blow by and you're thinking of a rebuild, well, that's going to cost you some money because no liners to remove. So you're going to have to either get a new short block or a long block or remove the head, remove your pistons, and have new press-in sleeves installed in the engine, which is not very cheap. Other issues with this engine, similar to the C7s, the oil pump idler gear can fail. And while not super common, this can cause a low or no oil pressure condition. So if you ever have the oil pan off to inspect or just for a leak, you're going to want to look at the idler gear on the oil pump to see if it's starting to wobble. It shouldn't have much play in it. Now this uses a pushrod design with the camshaft in the engine block and it has followers or lifters that are bolted to side covers on the intake side of the engine. And the side covers are a big source of oil leaks. If you have oil coming out of the intake side of the engine somewhere, it's most likely coming out of these side covers. Now the bushings that hold the rollers on for the lifters can fail sometimes. If you get a dead cylinder or a weak cylinder sometimes, it's not an injector, you might have had one of your followers fail, and that'll damage the camshaft and the follower, so you'd be looking at getting new lifters and a new camshaft. The biggest problem on these is it's a Huey system, and the Huey systems can fail, and the injectors can fail quite often. Um, they're not cheap. Either the pump or the injectors aren't cheap. The later model ones with the square pump on the C7s, they tended to have a lot more problems with the pump failing and wiping out all the injectors. And they made a, something called a Huey kit that would replace all of that as a set. And it's very expensive. You're looking at almost $4,000 just in parts costs to have that replaced. Outside of that, there's not a ton of problems. But, you know, you've got your follower issues and your injector issues, and they can give you a real headache, monetarily speaking. Also, being a Huey system, these are not the best for cold starting or hard starting conditions. Common rails are much easier starting in general, so are the older high pressure pumps. The Huey pumps are not, or the Huey systems aren't very good in cold starting conditions, mostly because they're relying on the oil pressure to fire the injectors, and of course, cold oil doesn't flow very well, and they have a bad tendency of being hard starting. Most of them have inlet air heaters, and that can kind of help. You might want to turn your key on, let the inlet air heater heat up for about 30 seconds before starting them, but they're still not very good cold starting engines. Now, if you do own one of these engines, there's one thing you need to check that hopefully has been updated already for you. And what that is, is a Huey oil supply line update. So between the Huey pump and the cylinder head is your Huey oil supply line. And I already mentioned that the Huey oil is very high pressure, you know, up to about 3,500 PSI. Well, the original oil supply line was a steel braided rubber hose that ran from the Huey pump to the cylinder head. And over time, that hose is going to get extremely brittle and can crack and can leak on you. 
Now, if it were to... Boom. And it can get extremely brittle, and over time it can crack or leak on you. Now, if it were to blow on you, just blow up, it would very rapidly spray extremely high-pressure oil all over the place. You know, potentially squirting on the turbo, causing a fire. If this was in an RV, it might, you know, spray up through your cab, spray over your alternator, all over the place. It's a real issue. Well, there's a fix for this, and it's your Huey Oil Supply Line Update Kit. So it takes it from a steel braided hose, it goes to a steel solid line. And you can do the repair yourself. All you're really doing is removing the line off the Huey pump and then the fitting going to the head and their quick connects. And you're going to be installing a O-ring boss to O-ring face connector on the Huey pump and the cylinder head and then installing that line. If that has not been done, you, if you own the engine, you know, this engine's almost 20 years old now, you will want to do that right away. And any dealer could do that for you as well, but it's a job you could do yourself with some basic wrenches and some mechanical know-how, okay? Outside of those problems there, they're, they're generally good running engines. They're simple to work on, very little specialty tooling needed to do anything on them. They do have an ECM that you would need CAT ET to communicate with if you wanted to do any sort of advanced troubleshooting. But in general, you can do most items yourself, even running the overhead, things like that are fairly easy. And these are metric engines, meaning that all the bolts are metric, you know, 13 millimeter, 16 millimeter, millimeter, things like that. And that's about the gist of these engines. I hope you enjoyed this video. We are going to do our destruction of the week segment now. This is our second installment of Destruction of the Week, and this engine came in for a lot of exhaust smoke, and this is a C7S. That's a lot of oil. There's a ton of oil in this intake, and it was smoking a lot out of the exhaust. So, pulled the intake tube off, found a lot of oil. This is the outlet of your charge air cooler. It's got about an inch of oil in it. Um, you can see it was getting pretty hot as well. The inlet side of the charger cooler also, about an inch of oil in it. So next thing I checked was the turbocharger and full of oil. The turbocharger had failed and dumped oil into the intake and out of the exhaust. Now that's a real problem because this has a DPF. And the DPF was totally saturated, basically garbage. So you're looking at 3,000 for the turbo, about 3,000 for the DPF, plus CAC cleaning, plus labor. So you are looking at about $8,000 total parts and labor to repair this failed turbocharger. Quite the big repair there. Hope you enjoyed the destruction of the week and hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.